Here is a, a super high-tech and incredibly fictional bug drone. But they appear to have hit everything but the target in this situation. Is there, is there a more difficult decision to make in war? My name's James Rogers, and I'm an academic who works on modern warfare, specifically drone warfare. I'm also the host of the History Hit Warfare podcast, and today I'm going to be looking at movies that depict modern conflict. The Hurt Locker. Back. But the bomb was forced on him. Get Go back. Back. Don't, Don't move. Stay Walk still. If you keep walking, we will shoot you. If you keep walking. This has to be one of the most dramatic scenes from this film. The Hurt Locker. I think between those who, who kind of work on these sort of topics, it's rated as one of the most, you know, the best film, the most accurate film that portrays just how tense and difficult this situation is. But more generally, I think it's pretty underrated as a film. Checkpoint said he had a bomb strapped to him, but he's sorry. He doesn't want it to go off. Then he starts begging us to take it off of him. Right. Help this man. He's not a bad man. He's not a bad man. He got a bomb strapped to him. It might seem simple. They're a terrorist. Shoot them, take them out before they kill anyone. But it's often the case that they're coerced into this situation. We've seen cases where women carrying children have been strapped up with bombs and, and put into marketplaces, and then they're remotely detonated. They don't detonate themselves, they're coerced, they're pushed into that situation. They're as much as a, of a victim as those that they kill. Here's your radio. Can we just shoot him? No, 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 no. he's a family man. He's not a bad man, he's just asking for help. Only help. Yeah, all right, look, just get back like everyone else. Help. 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 I got it. And this is a dramatization of a very real situation. These situations occurred during the Iraq war and they occurred during the war in Afghanistan as well. Let's do this. Come on. He says the bomb may have a timer. Please hurry. <laughs> We're good. You in now? Yep. You had this endless cat and mouse game between those who were deploying IEDs, improvised explosive devices, these, these plagues of munitions that were all over the country, buried under the dirt, buried um, in the foundations of buildings, hanging from trees, and those who sought to counter them. And then you had the use of suicide bombers, person-born IEDs, as they were called. If I just shoot you, do you understand? <laughs> And these EOD officers, these explosive ordnance disposal expertise, these, these people who have been trained for, you know, 5, 10, 20 years in how to disarm every type of bomb in a difficult situation, they are prized assets for the US military. And what those who were against the US would try and do, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, they would try and take these EOD expertise out. Because the more of those they could kill, then the less chance the Allies had to try and stop the spread of the IED. Roger that, tell me what you need. Ah, uh, the bolt cutters. And today it's got even worse, of course, because IEDs have taken to the sky, strapped to small commercial drone systems like ISIS used. Nope. What's this made out of? That's <laughs> what I The power of this explosive. We don't know what it is. It could be Semtex, it could be TNT, it could be parts of leftover Soviet mines and grenades from the Soviet invasions in Afghanistan, and then these weapons are moved over to Iraq. Hold on, let me think. Just let me think. Let's handle this. We're gonna have it's okay. We got this. We got this. Good lips, alright. Okay. And you've got to admire the attempts here to try and literally diffuse the situation. You can see the sweat dripping from them. They know that they're running out of time. I can't. I'm sorry. I, there's too many locks. There's too many, I can't do it. And they come to the realization there's nothing that they can do. Oh, it's, it's a tragic, horrific situation. It shows you the true horrors of war. One thing about the Hurt Locker is that it was meticulously researched and it's gone down in in history as an incredibly accurate film especially when it comes down to those those tense situations of what you do when you've got a civilian who has most literally been caught up in the war someone who has been placed in harm's way by terrorist actors by rebels by those who are seeking to defeat the coalition and how you respond to that how you try and save a, a civilian's life and the, the tension that real palpable tension in the city square there. I think it's in incredibly accurate. And, and, and sadly, I think the most accurate part of it is that often there wasn't much that the coalition partners could do. 
They would try, but in the end, these systems were made so that they could be booby-trapped, so that they would go off. So they would not only kill the person that they were strapped to, but they would try and kill as many coalition troops and as many civilians around as they could. I think one of the biggest developments of the Iraq war was the IED, and that's where you've got that focus in the Hurt Locker. The ability to create these, these explosive devices, these improvised explosive devices, IEDs, that can cost around $5 to make. And they're incredibly hard to counter. They could be laid in the road covered with dust, and you'd have convoys that were moving through and could be blown up. These convoys that were carrying millions, if not billions of dollars worth of US military materials that were trying to, to win in this war. In fact, the counter IED effort did run into the millions and billions of dollars. This was something that was a real plague to the US and slowed down advances in the country to a snail's pace. Beasts of no nation. You got out of fucking way. What is this thing doing here? This is a, a hard scene to watch, but it's, it's important, it's necessary, it's important to depict this in this film because this happens all around the world today. We think that child soldiers being taken from their homes or their parents being killed off and, and, and orphans then being used on the front lines of battle for these warlords, we think it's a thing of the past. We might relegate it back to perhaps the use of child soldiers in, in Nazi Germany or during the Cold War period in, in Africa or perhaps during the 1990s with the breakdown of the, the kind of post-Cold War world and the rise of these new wars, as they were called, that were developed and depicted by, by violence and by trying to make money, by drug trafficking, by arms trafficking, by human smuggling. But the truth is, is this still happens around the world in pretty much every continent today. A boy has hands to strangle and fingers to pull triggers. Why are you saying a boy is nothing? Huh? A boy is very, very dangerous. You understand? One thing that allowed the use of child soldiers in these sort of wars and these sort of battles was the advent and the spread of the AK-47. It's a weapon that can be deployed by someone who is smaller and younger. It is light enough for them to carry. It is versatile enough. It's not accurate, but if you send enough child soldiers to your front line wheeling AK-47s, then you can make some sort of impact on your enemy. And there's, there's, there's famous quotes about this period in time. Uh, Michael Ignatiev said, where is the warrior's honor when you have a, a child wielding a Kalashnikov in battle? I tell him, yeah, we'll be helping you. You see, Striker is hungry, he'll eat you. Huh? What are you doing here? Beasts of No Nation is, well, literally based on no particular conflict, but it amalgamates so many different battles that are happening around the world, both now and back in the 1990s. So it draws on elements of the use of child soldiers in Rwanda, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And you can see so many similarities with what's going on around the world today with the use of child soldiers in wars in Yemen and in Libya. This is a plague, a blight that really hasn't left us. It's said there are up to a quarter of a million child soldiers used around the world today. Oh, you must say it like you're prouder. Agu. One more time. Agu. Uh -huh. The tragedy of this scene is where are the laws of war? Where are the international norms? Where is the, the warrior's honor when you've got this child wielding a, a Kalashnikov, an AK-47, in battle? It is truly a, a disgusting indictment of the state of modern conflict. Formation! Formation! Our bridge, we are taking it! Yes, sir! Yes, sir. This is where you see these, these soldiers that they've kidnapped, recruited, trained, and put on the front lines. Yeah, how old is the youngest child there? I mean, five, six, seven? Idris Elba plays this part so well. I'm not taking no girls. Are you ready to fight? Yes, sir! Are you ready to fight? Yes, sir! And what's the point of all of this? You know, are they fighting for democracy, for a better life for those around them? No, these are warlords. 
And the key thing is, is that these are part of what, what Mary Caldor called new wars of the 1990s. These fragmented nations, this internal fighting. And what are they fighting for? They're fighting for money. They're fighting for the right to, to traffic drugs or, or weapons, even to smuggle humans, sex trafficking. Every part of this is just steeped in some of the lowest, most depraved acts of humanity. And one thing they're not showing you here is that, you know, these children are, are terrified. They're truly, truly terrified. But what they do to overcome this is they, they jack them up on, on drugs. They make them feel like they're invincible. And why use child soldiers? Well, they're malleable, they're impressionable, they're easy to manipulate. All the things that a warlord needs to make money and keep power. And you can see these aren't highly trained, highly skilled warriors. They just have enough child soldiers to make a difference. They're, they're disposable to these warlords. They don't care how many they kill, how many die. In places like the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, wars have been raging for, for generations now. And so you've got you know, generational conflict. You've got orphans that have been left over from the last phase of battle. And when you've got no thriving economy, what are these kids gonna do? They come into these, these gangs, these groups, these factions. They often feel like this is their, their only option to get, to get fed, to be part of a, a family and a community. And all of that is betrayed. Betrayed in them when they're sent to die like this. Although this film is focused on a, a fictional conflict, it brings in so many factors from very real wars that are happening and have happened all around the world. So perhaps most closely related would be the use of child soldiers in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where wars are still raging to this day. There's also been the use of child soldiers in Rwanda during the 1990s. And this is still a very modern phenomena. You just need to look to Yemen or, or to Libya to see that child soldiers are still very much seen as an asset by warlords and even governments around the world today. The use of child soldiers in war goes back to ancient times. We just need to think of the Spartans. But in the 20th century, there was more of a taboo around using children in war. After all, we have the Geneva Conventions and the laws of war, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't a common appearance. When you look at the First World War, we know that people lied about their age to get into the trenches. But in the Second World War, you see the explicit use of children in war by the Nazi regime. The Third Reich, as it was crumbling and falling, falling on its knees, started to deploy those in the Hitler Youth. Children who would be sent to the front lines, who would be sent to the front of the Eastern Front to fight the Soviets. And they would die a soldier's death, but they were no more than teenagers or even younger. American Sniper. Hey, this is Taya. I can't get to the phone, so please so here's Bradley Cooper, an American sniper, and he's playing one of the most successful snipers in the history of the US military, Chris Kyle. I think he had around 150 confirmed kills and was awarded a number of medals for, for valor as a result of that. But the situations that he must have been left in, the decision about whether to kill or not, I mean, it's incredibly difficult. They say there's lots of parallels between snipers and drone pilots today. You've, you've both got that, that intimacy of battle that most soldiers don't have. When you're in a firefight, you don't know where you're shooting often. You're just shooting at whoever's firing at you and you, you don't know who you killed. But the difference between that and a sniper is you see here, you know exactly who you're going to kill and you know that you're the one who killed them. And although that decision there might have been clear enough, the fact that you've got a child running into the fray, I mean, this becomes so much more complex.
obviously it's clear that the child, when they're a non-combatant, you know, has to be protected in war at, at pretty much all costs. But this moment here, this is where it turns nasty. In reality, they now have the legal authority to take this kill shot. This child, and it's one of the horrors of war, this child becomes a combatant. <sighs> I mean, I don't even have words to describe this scene. I don't know how you'd be able to, to sleep at night or to just manage that, that, that PTSD if you had to take that shot. Is there, is there a more difficult decision to make in war? As a US sniper, Chris Carl would have faced so many difficult decisions. And I think the film portrays that pretty well as you see the child picking up that rocket launcher, that bazooka. But in reality, it gets even more difficult than that. In asymmetric warfare, as we call it, you can't really distinguish between civilian and combatant because the combatants are often dressed as civilians and they often use children in those roles, especially when it comes down to IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Children won't be carrying guns they'll be sent up towards US coalition troops carrying a key fob or a mobile phone that will detonate the bomb that is there to kill coalition forces. And so making that choice about whether or not to kill a child, well, it has to be one of the hardest jobs and the most puzzling and troubling dilemmas in modern warfare. Eye in the sky. Here in this film, they're showing kind of just how difficult it is to distinguish between civilian and combatant, how the combatants are just entwined in the everyday life of society. And if you try and strike them, then you're going to have, well, what they call collateral damage, the killing of civilians. Here is a, a super high-tech and incredibly fictional bug drone. We do have tiny drones nowadays. You've got like nano drones that are, are pretty small and can go into compounds before soldiers. And one day you're gonna have systems like this that can be controlled by, by remote control quite close to where it's operating or even by satellite from thousands of kilometers away. Like drones are operated today, like Predator and Reaper drones are controlled by US operatives back in, uh, in, in Nevada, in the desert, at Crease Air Force Base, and they deploy over thousands of kilometers away. But you don't have the tech like this yet. But let's suspend belief a little bit. In that complex environment of asymmetric warfare, where you don't know who is combatant, who is civilian, who is friend, who is foe, a system like this can really help identify if the target you want to take out, that high value target that you want to assassinate is in the building you're gonna blow up, or if it's, I mean, in some cases we've seen it's been a hospital, an orphanage, some of the most terrible mistakes have been made in targeting over the last 20 years. And here's the question. Is this a religious meetup? Is this an afternoon or morning prayer? Or is this a terrorist cell poised to conduct an attack on US or British assets? When I've spoken to drone operators, you know, one thing they've said to me is it's, it's so ambiguous because terrorists, before they commit an attack, they might conduct a, a session of, of prayer, especially if it's a religiously motivated terrorist attack. Hawaii 5, confirm PID, please. Now, this technology we do have today. Here you can have these, these, these points that make up the human face that can be used in facial recognition to identify if this is the right or the wrong person. And here you can see Helen Mirren as a, a high level commanding officer in the British military is saying that they have identified this target. But we can't enter the uh, militia controlled area. No. What's the plan, General? Well, and now it's a political decision. 
Remember, war is always a continuation of politics by other means, as Clausewitz said, and so you've got to get political approval. We could eliminate her. Absolutely not. Ma'am, she's a member of Al-Shabaab and number four on our East African most wanted list. I don't care about your list, General. I came Assassination, of course, is, is illegal under international law. You can take someone out for what they're planning to do, for what they're planning to do, but you can't kill them for what they've done in the past. You have to bring them to justice. So if you're killing them for what they've done in the past, if you're assassinating them, that is an extra judicial killing. Okay, zoom in. Ah, so this is a really difficult situation. They've been cleared to engage. The drone pilot and the remote sensor operator who are watching the situation have got political and legal clarification. They've been given orders that they need to take that strike. But a civilian has wandered into the situation. And so the drone pilot here is saying, well, I'm gonna watch the situation. I, I'm, I'm not sure I wanna take this strike. Those men are about to disperse. Engage now. Ma'am, I understand we have clearance. I will fire if I see the ACI is moving or when this girl is out of the frag radius. But I now, it might seem odd that a drone pilot can say this. And in reality, they should be undertaking their, their orders. They should be just taking the strike. But over many years now, when I've spoken to drone operators, they tell me that one thing that's quite uh, more common than we think is drone conscientious objectors, those who refuse to take these strikes and these orders handed down by politicians and military leaders. Lieutenant, you have clearance. There is a lot more at stake than you see here in this image. Ma'am, I need you to run the collateral damage estimate again with this girl up front. The it's at this point here that they would simply remove the drone pilot from the situation and they would replace them. The portrayal of drone warfare in Eye in the Sky isn't that realistic, especially when it comes to the technology itself. For example, the beetle that is used, that little beetle drone doesn't exist. You've got small nano drones that could be used in that situation, but it would be pretty clear to spot. And the, the camera itself wouldn't be that clear. It'd be grainy black and white footage. But when it comes to the actual, the larger drone that's operated by Aaron Paul there, well, that would be a medium altitude, long endurance system, a big predator or reaper drone that's 30, 40, 50,000 feet in the air. Again, the quality of that footage that you see, it's like HD 4K, it wouldn't be that good. Back in 2016, when that film was made, it was still grainy in black and white, although it has much improved today. One thing I will say, it looks quite realistic, is that the idea that you can object in that situation, that a drone pilot could say, well, actually, I don't want to take this strike. Well, they can protest, and that has happened, but they would simply be removed from the situation. And all that political deliberating, if it comes to the fact that there is a high value target there and they're planning an attack on the US, Britain, and its allies, well, there wouldn't be that many deliberations. They would take that strike. 12 strong. Resident, Agent Ardo Somas. Christ, he's called fucking Taliban. So this is in Afghanistan. They're likely up and around the, the Tora Bora mountains at that point where they were trying to hunt any Taliban and also Al-Qaeda down. One thing the Americans had on their side at this point, of course, was, well, here you go, they had air power. They had command of the air. There was no one to contest them. In, in flying in that third dimension in airspace, which is a major advantage in any war. I'll copy, over. Alpha 595, I copy. 8472-6543, over. Roger, drop. And so the Taliban were incredibly vulnerable to, to airstrikes. And you think of the power of, of a bomber like that. It looks like something like a, like a B-52, and it renders these, these tanks pretty useless if they can hit the target. That's flying well out of range of any of their, you know, their bazookas, their anti-air systems, anything they have really. But they appear to have hit everything but the target in this situation which would be pretty unrealistic because you got Chris Hemsworth here. He'd, he'd usually have like a, a laser pointer designator. And so you would pinpoint in on the target and then it would be relayed up to the, the, the bomber up above. 
and then, then they would hone in on that signal. No, because that's for It's rare that you get a missing of the target nowadays. It's one thing that the US has developed over the last 100 years. I mean, the first kind of precision weapons that they were trying to develop were, were made back in 1917. They got lots of, lots of practice with this. For the foreseeable future, there's going to be a place for the bomber in the US Air Force. I mean, the bombers you see in this film, they're B-52s. They've been around all the way through the Cold War. They're the backbone of the US Air Force. They're descendants of the bombers that were pioneered during the Second World War. But what you are going to see is this augmentation with uncrewed aerial vehicles, with drones. Right now, the US Air Force are developing loyal wingmen systems. So these are drones that sit off the edge of B-52s and other bomber systems. They're controlled by the pilot themselves. They're deployed so that if enemy air defenses are firing at the B-52, they can act as decoys and be shot down, allowing the B-52 more chance of getting through to its target. So yeah, the bomber is going to remain in the US Air Force, but you're going to see far more drones. When you see the bomber miss its targets there, then that's been an error from the soldier on the ground. The fact that they've got the coordinates wrong is something that can happen, but really is quite unlikely. If you're in that position, then you're trained in incredibly well, and you should be making sure that the bomber hits the target with pinpoint precision. Now, the one thing that can go wrong in these situations is you get the intelligence completely wrong. So you still hit the target, the target that's been designated, but the people inside might be civilians. So you can guarantee destruction, but in some cases, that destruction might simply mean that you guarantee the death of civilians. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you want more, then listen to my Warfare podcast twice a week, every week. There's a link on the screen now.